Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, jo Mr. Joe Slamik, um, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, TGH uh, from Manila. And of course, he's won a name throughout the tourism sector in the country. Globally, he's also very popular, popular in promoting Kerala tourism and Ayurveda in fact. <clears throat> and I had the privilege of working with him when I was in the tourism sector. And uh, I welcome Rakesh. Uh, Mao's activity in the nature of tourism. Um, he, he joined recently, but he is doing a, uh, an exemplary job there, understanding the tourism system well and trying to face the challenges, particularly the late challenge of Karuna. I also welcome um, Mr. Anurag, uh, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer uh, Leela, Leela Hotels, um, which is a great popular its elegance <coughs> and uh, the service delivery. Um, uh, we would like to hear from you also, and uh, uh, I also welcome uh, Mr. Lama, President of HIV, um, HPS, uh, uh, HPS. Lama Ji, you can hear me now? I think there is some problem once again. Yeah, so here now, today I would like to invite you to this webinar, particularly a more specific uh, uh, examination of the hotel industry. Uh, it is that totally tourism, but hotel industry, which is the major component of the tourism sector. In hotel industry, this uh, webinar I would to uh, have divided in four major challenges where we can address. One is the revenue challenge, because that is ultimately uh, after the human rights is uh, the tourism sector and the human sector, which is um, now which we see uh, complete, complete uh, decimation of the sector. So, where, what kind of revenues are we looking at? Right from your GDP, right from your generation uh, and uh, your experience, the relationship between the, um, the owner of the hotel and the, and the management, management, management uh, of the hotel. So, those new models are always coming up and are getting this revenue back, um, not 100%. 100%. The JL report is in the out. The JL report says that no, we came up. Hi, Mr. Rao, is that? Uh, so we've lost the audio. Can you hear me? No, your audio is not Hello? not uh, not uh, anymore. Issue with audio. Sandeep ji, dekhi kya? Is the local issue? The audio audio is not very clear. Getting closer to us. It's okay now. Can somebody check on this uh, your Rakesh? Rakesh is okay now? It's not the best, but there uh, yeah. me. Yes, you, we lost you in between now. Okay, now this webinar, I would like to have this divided report, uh, major uh, components and uh, major, major divisions. So, rebuilding the domestic and the international marketing, you know, how the industry is going to address this domestic tourism as well as international tourism it is another thing. The employment challenge is another area which I want to focus. So before we take off, then I'll request Rakesh Verma, the general secretary of the of Tourism, to um, uh, tell us about exactly the preparedness of the ministry and support this which has already been given to the industry in the tourism sector in this country. So welcome, Rakesh. The audio doesn't seem to be very clear. Uh, thank you, you, sir. Hi, uh, Mandeep. I think you're able to hear Yes, you. I think. Well, all right. Mr. Rao, I'm not able to really hear you or even actually see you. It seems to be very. But please go ahead. Akesh, Akesh, uh, thank you, sir, for inviting me. Yes, I, I can. I could hear in parts. Uh, but I get a sense of it, sir. And uh, as you all understand, uh, this travel, hospitality, and tourism is the most impacted sector uh, out of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And it has gone through the most unprecedented crisis. Uh, 
while there is still uncertainty about the future one could see the signs of recovery i mean that's how the reports uh, have been coming uh, the challenge before us uh, all of us today is how do we increase the pace of recovery will it be a v shaped recovery that some are talking about or it will be a more flattened recovery over a period of uh, time and what is going to be the new normal what should we prepare ourselves for as i look at it there are three major changes uh, which will determine the new normal that we are talking about for the hospitality industry the first is about health and hygiene becoming a paramount uh, concern and distancing and disinfecting is here to be adopted universally it will have implications for physical spaces for planning for experiences and places and all those jobs which are involved in physical contacts will have to be relooked and reimagined the second is use of information and communication technology we already seen during this pandemic you know the kind of advances we have made for connecting and networking and communicating uh, using digital technologies that's here to stay even before pandemic uh, we had you know the increasing role of technology in all fields and particularly even in the hospitality field everyone is now used to remote working and technology based work avoiding physical contact and so digital skills will be important in 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 the new normal the third is about sustainability and responsibility i think this pandemic has taught us all the importance of uh, looking at sustainable development and becoming more responsible so in future all our endeavors all businesses will have to have sustainable and responsible practices uh, on our part in the ministry of tourism we are looking at uh, uh, unlocking the sector that's been the first priority so we work with home ministry we work with ministry of health and family welfare to design protocols to design operational guidelines and we have been uh, substantially able to unlock uh, the hospitality sector uh, to begin with obviously there are still state specific uh, uh, restrictions which are there and i think the industry also feels uh, that we probably need more uniformity more consistency in these regulations across uh, the states and we are again working with home ministry to most of the states have now recognized that you know we have to live with covid 19 so they are opening up they are uh, you know uh, easing the restrictions but there are still irritants and so that's the first priority that let's really unlock the sector let's really now uh, uh, with obviously all the precautions and all the uh, social distancing norms but one of the irritants again was that uh, the limit of 100 persons for banqueting you know there are many uh, units which have facilities much bigger than that and the cost of operating those facilities uh, will not justify having the smaller gathering so that again we are pursuing with ministry of home affairs that you know in case there is a capacity there are arrangements we should not be putting these kind of uh, uh, limits for industry and again building confidence of the tourists and the staff we have also launched an initiative called sathi that is system for assessment awareness and training for hospitality industry this system is designed both quality council of india it's based on the ministry of health and ministry of tourism guidelines so anyone who wants to really understand those guidelines can visit our website can take a self assessment test it gives you an idea as to what are the uh, you know principles which is to be followed what are the guidelines of the ministry which are to be followed it can also attend a webinar so he is given in detail you know the training by our uh, officials about these measures which are to be put in place third he can also invite the team for site assessment so the team goes and tells them what are the improvements required where the the processes of the unit may not be complying with the guidelines we are also looking at relaunching you know the domestic uh, tourism and that's where uh, the early signs of recovery will happen so dekho apna desh that's the campaign the ministry has launched to really get people out and and communicating to them that uh, now they probably need to come out and we are also working with the industry to launch a joint initiative convincing people to really uh, maybe they start within the district within the nearby states maybe two days itinerary but this campaign is about uh, getting to people come out responsibly obviously they have 
have to follow the social norm the social distancing norms and that will be our first challenge that we have to work with the industry that we jointly convince people that uh, they have to trust the industry they have to trust the future and live with this and come out otherwise the demand will not pick up and unless the demand picks up it will be very difficult for the industry to survive they've already suffered for long period so this confidence building measures again i i, I feel the industry also needs to i'm sure they are taking steps they should talk about those steps they should really convince people that uh, you know you have taken enough precautions and if they follow uh, the social distancing and the other norms it's very safe for them to come out so i think uh, uh, after opening up of the sector the next immediate challenge for us is to really uh, build that confidence and ask people that they should come out and and that's how the demand will uh, start picking up so with these i'm sure with the, the kind of resilience we have in our people and in the industry i'm sure uh, in, in in a short time we'll be able to really get back to where we were and uh, if we jointly work uh, uh, from the ministry side we are always available and it's a good initiative that itdc has taken i think a lot of industry leaders will have to take this and probably get together discuss what are the options available to us and how we can jointly uh, you know pursue them so from the ministry side we we uh, are always there for the support whatever is required by the industry and we hope for the good times thank you oh well, thank you so much kesh thank you so much for presenting us uh, intense and focus of the ministry and the activity that uh, ministry has uh, lined up and uh, we certainly had uh, such the uh, other ministries like in home and uh, health family where uh, civil particularly because uh, uh, civil aviation sector which is really collapsed and uh, we are trying to vande bharat is one of the um, uh, i think a few uh, of the uh, things which are happened good for the whole sector to pass some period so that vande bharat so very important by ministry of tourism and uh, um, and industry in delhi particularly uh, real part of it is that lockdown period um, uh, and also sathi uh, also you know it's a very good initiative uh, of the ministry confidence building is something which is very important because when people go to the hotels should feel that uh, they are very safe so preparing the hygiene hotel all the hotel has issued uh, sathi um which every every hotel is now uh, has adopted and so practices so coming to the second point of uh, the talking about the hotel industry taking um, the revenue aspect to this this damage so how is how is the hotel industry is dealing with uh, the lease period periods these items the taxes and issues i'm also seeing actually uh, lease we have been leased out many of the shops in my you know so how do you give the wear off how do you give the proper permit of this you know? and there is uh, there is issue of permit of uh, uh, rent um, uh, between the operator and owner uh, right from uh, the stress thing the guest uh, uh, department in terms of finances is uh, uh, is a big challenge for us so how are we going to deal with this threat special aspects of this i request uh, this lamba this lamba to uh, sorry ma'am i is another another to um deal with the uh, revenue hi is this for me or this question mr raj am i एक्चुअली सर ये तो आई टी डी सी का था सर एक रूरल पे सर आपने जो रिमार्क्स आए थे ना सर उस पर एक कंसल्टेशन रखा था सर अभी सो वो बी सी ज्वाइन करनी है सर बस हाँ सर आपका मैसेज आया था इसलिए मैंने आपको डिस्टर्ब किया सर वो पेपर कलेक्ट कर लिए सर जो भी थे नॉर्थ ईस्ट और वो भी सर प्रेजेंटेशन दोनों लेके मैं आ जाऊंगा सर राजेंद्र शॉप इमीडिएट से सर आई थिंक यू आर अटेंडिंग अदर वेबिन अदर मीटिंग कैन यू मीट योरसेल्फ राकेश आई थिंक नाउ ही शुड आउट ये आई इज वेलकम अमित बाजी थ्रो अ स्लाइड अबाउट सेवन जनरेशन इश्यूज right i 
I am assuming this question is for me because it's not very clear, Mr. Rao. Uh, is this question for me on revenue? Yeah, you as a before the beginning of the webinar, this is a handy. Okay. I must admit I have not been able to hear anything. But let me answer, let me try and address this issue, assuming that it's for me. And if it is for Anurag, uh, Anurag, you want to raise your hand? Uh, or, or you want I, me to? I can hear you, Mandy. I can hear you, Mandy. <laughs> so, okay, let's deal with it in part because it's not clear. Maybe you can add a little more uh, as you know, you're in the thick of it in any case, Anurag. Uh, and you're dealing with it on a day to day basis. So, I'm sure you can add more to this. But let me just say that, uh, let me give you a little bit of statistics and beginning, and then maybe Anurag can add a little more to this. Given that there's a little bit of audio disturbance, we're not able to fully apprehend. I'm assuming that the question is regarding the revenue losses that the industry is incurring. Uh, and what is the industry likely to do to sort of recover from these losses? Uh, and also some of the steps that the government may need to take to assist the industry. So just to put it in perspective, um, we estimate and you know we published a report earlier on during the pandemic and many things have changed since um, because when you know when the pandemic started uh, there was very little understanding of how long this is going to last or what really is going to happen we have a little more um, you know information now and some more understanding um, so for the hotel sector the estimated losses of revenue if you look at the branded semi-organized and the unorganized hotels is somewhere around 10 billion us dollars is the estimated losses that's going to come out of this. Um, revenues over the previous year are going to be impacted by almost around 50%. Um, that's really roughly where the scale of this is, uh, as we can estimate today, uh, how long it takes for the recovery is still everybody's guess. Um, I think what has been a little bit of a um, issue for the industry and actually not little bit, but I think significant issue for the industry is that, um, you know, so far there's been a lot of talk of the government coming in and supporting um, the travel, the tourism and the hospitality industry. But on the ground, we haven't really seen too much happening as of now. Uh, <clears throat> while we keep hearing that there is something, um, you know, likely to happen, it now seems that, um, you know, the industry is beginning to see a huge amount of impact and uh, has been waiting patiently for the government to come in. Some of the areas where I think the government needs to come in are on the taxes um, and how those can be utilized better by the industry. I think there has been representations by all the industry bodies to the government on a few things. One of them being on GST. Firstly, the sort of reduction in GST and rationalizing GST so that hotels become a little more attractive during this period to reduce the GST, uh, you know, the rates. Uh, across hotels and restaurants and in the restaurants case allow them input credit as well so that it becomes a little more um, impactful for them and it gives them some more avenues to sort of mitigate the problem at hand also we had said that you know the gst collection which has happened and the income tax collection which has happened against that collection over the last two year period every enterprise should be given a loan to the extent of the collection of the last two years which can be repaid over a seven year period which gives cash flows uh, to the industry to sort of um, you know deal with the uh, severity of the impact that we are facing uh, in the industry uh, thirdly we had also said that there should be a working capital fund which the government should put in which assists the sector in keeping um, you know many of the people employed because one of the biggest fallouts of uh, this pandemic is, is, you know, the 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 unemployment uh, that's going to take place when we're trying to re reduce our costs. Since there is no revenue, ultimately jobs have been lost, and that's uh, another of our requests to the government to help us put that back, uh, you know, uh, together. Uh, on the debt restructuring, there's been some work. The RBI has come out um, you with know, the restructuring issues. But when, when I read those restructuring issues, I still feel there are a fair amount of challenges uh, on that and not all hotels will be able to benefit uh, from that restructuring given the norms which are there in the restructuring document. 
Um, but however, uh, we're still trying to read between the lines on that and get a better understanding before I can fully remark on that. Uh, Prima facie, it does seem that not everybody will benefit from the restructuring exercise as laid out in the document, which is in the public domain. Uh, otherwise, on revenue generation, what we are seeing, as was spoken earlier, um, is that we're seeing some bit of business come back to hotels uh, after the very, very severe lockdown and the extended lockdown for hotels. We're seeing some business return to hotels. Um, leisure seems to be the sector where we are seeing, uh, you know, some green shoots and I'm sure Joel will be able to speak more at length about that later when uh, he takes on um, the answering. Um, uh, that's really where we're seeing the highest impact. Corporate travel is still very, very slow and it's going to take a little time before corporate travel comes back uh, as corporates are not at the moment traveling. Uh, the extent of the pandemic is still pretty much, um, you know, growing and therefore there are still concerns on that. Um, but hotels are trying to do many things uh, to get revenues back. Of course, one aspect on revenue generation which has started happening in hotels is the focus on ancillary revenues. So most of the hotels are getting into areas of generating revenue which were not ordinarily or earlier the focus for hotels. Uh, of course, the most common one out of that um, has been the food and beverage business or extending the food and beverage business when customers can't come to your hotel to take the food and beverage business to their homes. So a lot of the delivery platforms have emerged in hotels, which was not happening earlier. And, and uh, there has been a reasonable amount of success uh, in the food and beverage delivery business. But there are many other ancillary businesses which hotels are now beginning to review. Um, you know, which are outside the normal sort of revenue generating departments that we had. We're looking at co-working spaces. Um, we're looking at warehousing. We're looking at urban warehousing. We're looking at housekeeping services. We're looking at laundry services. We're looking at facility management for offices. And we're trying to extend all the facilities which are available inside a hotel and see how we can leverage them given that we are not utilizing most of the capacity that we have inside a hotel to find clients outside hotels where we can take those services. So a lot of work is going on towards ancillary revenues. And I think that's going to be the one silver lining out of this in the long term. When the pandemic is over, hotels would have discovered that there are more revenues uh, for hotels to generate outside of the traditional rooms and food and beverage um, that are the larger revenue generating areas inside hotels. So that's one area I think where uh, a fair amount of work is going and a fair amount of focus is coming um, uh, into hotels. Um, we feel that um, given whatever is happening at this moment in time and if we can look into a crystal ball um, and, and, and predict something, then our prediction is that we should reach occupancy levels uh, pre-pandemic occup occupancy levels around the uh, third quarter of 2022 and we will reach the ADR REPAR levels uh, by around the second quarter of 2023. That's really what it's looking like at this moment but a lot is going to depend uh, on when the vaccine really comes. So our estimate is that the bounce back really will start for revenue generation around the middle of next year by which time we anticipate that there will be a vaccine there will be reasonable number of people who have, who would have been inoculated and the medical fraternity would have had enough exposure to the pandemic to be dealing with it far better having a standard protocol for treatment and the mortality rate further coming down which means that the pandemic uh, the the fear of the pandemic will will grossly come down given the vaccine and the ability of the medical fraternity to deal with it. And that's when we feel that the bounce back will really come. We do believe that there will be serious bounce back in this industry. And ultimately, we will see a lot of revenge travel and um, you know things coming back and growing further after the very, very serious drop. At this moment in time, we seriously need help to tie over the situation that we are in. Thank you, Mandip ji. Now, I think now you can hear me. You can see me and I you can. can hear me properly. Yeah, yeah, yes. we have done some yes. uh, 
Joe's and Anurag will know exactly what they are being asked. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Anurag can continue here because I'll I'll invite Joe Snater because he has to speak a lot to us. We have to learn right. learn a lot from him because I'm asking interesting uh, Joe's to speak about uh, the international and domestic tourism revival. So Anurag can continue from here because he speaking about the taxation thing. Um, it's 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 good that you know Mr. Mandeep Ji was mentioning about uh, the debt restructuring by RBI. Mr. Kamath's report. We have all of us have read that report. And uh, under Atmanirbhar Bharat, I think there's some kind of incentive, some kind of support system has come out. Some schemes have come out under Atmanirbhar Bharat. And but still, lot to be done, lot to be done because the kind of loss which has been unprecedented uh, for this hotel industry, and the timing which uh, Mandeep Ji is mentioning is 2022 or third quarter um, uh, is is a very long uh, period uh, for many of the hotels to survive. And as was mentioning that the JLL report mentions that you know even maybe after two years, 30 to 35 percent of the hotels may not open also. It may die natural death. You know, um, and I'm not talking about four star and five star of uh, higher age, but you know, smaller uh, two star hotels and uh, basically the, the depending on the uh, debt uh, debt um, equity is very high, where uh, debt is very high, that those people will certainly have um, uh, serious ramifications. <clears throat> Anurag, you can um, uh, take up and tell us more about uh, the, how you are trying to uh, face this challenge and how you are trying to adjust these finances. About your deferment of your because some of the properties you're the owner, somewhere you're not. Uh, your taxation, can you just throw your life to somewhere else? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Khan, and thanks, Randy. I think uh, what Mandeep touched upon uh, are some points which are very, very critical for all of us, you know, like life blood for all hotel years. I think we are today such an uncharted territory that we really, uh, as Mandeep says, to quote him, looking into a crystal ball and trying to predict. When the occupancy returns and the rest will come back, and I tend, and I tend to agree with Mandeep's and HVS's uh, uh, report that it's not going to be before 23 uh, that we reach uh, the 2019 levels, despite the green shoots of recovery that are happening, especially in Malaysia. I think all these changes have been very non-linear, and we, we believe that this kind of a recessionary uh, outlook is going to be there till again saying till the vaccine comes out or till the fear of corona and the fear of the pandemic gets significantly dissipated. So a uh, long story like we really have no control over our top lines and the revenues. Uh, inbound and international movement is not likely to start before Q4 of 21 at the earliest. Uh, that again contingent the vaccine may go out and we have to really cater to what's happening within the country, the domestic. So earlier when I heard Mr. Verma speak about some of the programs that the government is rolling out in terms of how to promote domestic tourism, uh, and all that, that's really hard thing because that's really going to really uh, fuel uh, demand and hopefully allow us for the to keep our lives on. We as an industry have never faced the challenge of this magnitude and, and this kind of a dissipation of our revenue is usually overnight uh, starting from the month of March. So I think but I think uh, every adversity brings about certain opportunity and what it has done really for us, speaking on behalf of the industry, is that we have really gone back to the drawing board and realized that what do we need to do as hoteliers to keep our business relevant, especially when we have no control over the top line and we can't really predict our top line. What do we do in this cycle? How do we ensure that when there is so much of uncertainty, uncertainty about capital, uncertainty about uh, the business coming in. How do we sustain our businesses to be able to service our debts, to be able to you know, take our business and keep our lives on, so to speak. So COVID has really accelerated our needs and you know, our, our needs to be more efficient, uh, to be more productive and look at every line item of our cost to see how we can be uh, you know, how we can find more value, how can we unlock more value. But we spoke a lot in terms of ancillary revenues and, uh, you know, the focus on food and beverage, there will be platforms and capacity utilization. And, and these are brilliant topics. And I think uh, this is what was the one thing that everybody has certainly strung up and looked at. Look, if there is no regular room revenue coming in, and even the FNB revenue, which came from social and wedding, is contained to a certain number. We need to find more revenues for revenue. 
technology adoption has got to be the big play because we realize the cost of technology in our country today uh, is still sustainable and affordable and we really need to use technology to bring, become more efficient and to offer more value to all stakeholders. But the biggest impact I think that COVID has brought in has been in our uh, on our fixed cost. And all of all of us who remain relevant have started looking at our fixed cost and manpower as it is the number one of them. We have very limited control really in terms of heat, light, and power other than bringing in operational efficiencies. Uh, repair and maintenance, I would say, is something that, especially in the luxury segment, we would like our hotels to, five-star hotels especially, to always be uh, spotless and shiny. And plus, uh, uh, you know, the new campaigns like Vila Suraksha that we have launched, all of that costs us money to ensure that the hotels are safe and sanitized. So the one cost that we are really looking at, and I don't mean in terms of impacting jobs, but is what can we do more with less? You know, so that's something to do with how do we uh, recalibrate our business, how do we process and repurpose our business, and yet we keep that keep that confidence level high. You know, one big thing that I always keep looking at is that you know, at the humanity is at the heart of hospitality, and whatever we try to do, whatever impact we try to do, we need to keep that in mind. So what have we what have we done is uh, uh, obviously we have tried to right size and see where are the positions which are needed today and for the future. What we also have to do is to recalibrate and remove a few silos between departments. Uh, people who can do multitasking, who can manage multiple departments, can manage multiple roles, making sure that you know, we don't have departmental boundaries. And we're also looking at efficiencies in heart of the house, uh, especially finance, human resources, and information technology where we can create clusters and making efficiency, especially in the same market, yet we have multiple properties. We have to get slightly more creative about you know, our hiring, you know, because we have resorts which have the reality of business. So we're looking at how to get more creative about the quality of our resources between peak seasons and off seasons, how we can move them around. And I'm sure as we go forward, we'll see that the entire service design is going to change. It's already changing. One key topic that you know uh, we hear about, uh, and I think as uh, Madhish said at the point, amongst the many, is that our guest expectations changing. How are we as hoteliers dealing with it? And I remember another panel discussion when this was posed up. So while I know uh, it's uh, certain hotels may not choose to, I mean the brand standards are what they are, and the brand. But yes, there is more awareness even from the customers that uh, in terms of. That these are tough times, and they have to understand that the hotels are doing the best to keep the service standards at a certain level. And we have to really monetize that kind of life. So I think I was talking earlier about getting creative about the whole manpower thing. Um, uh, there's not too many big hotels opening in the next two or three years. Although there'll be opportunities for transition, I think the way the industry has been impacted. So. It's all about repurposing and uh, re, you know, uh, redeploying the current resources and also ensuring that there's a steady pool of people when you need them. I mean, one question that everybody looks at is that do you have a 12 month job for an individual? And now there are, I'm sure there will be partners and there will be, you know, our parties that will come and become manpower suppliers who will provide you clean, capable, and resourced manpower when you need them. I mean, if you need them three days a week, they come to you for three days a week. There will be many, many experts and consultants who will be giving you job-wise production and like kind of project-wise service without being tied down to your payroll uh, throughout the year. So many such things are, I think, are, like I said, getting creative. And also a pool of resources who, who could be working in the same segment uh, maybe there is uh, there could be an element of outsourcing that's going to come up. I mean, we are looking at how we can centralize certain functions that reduces the cost burden from our individual properties. Uh, because, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we are also owners of certain assets. So, as an ownership company, we can look at certain functions that we can centralize to the corporate office. I mean, this has this change and this reset and this, I would say, the reset in thinking. It's permanent, 
that this transformation is going to be there for the next two or three years. Because, you know, if I would say uh, we have gone through the last four or five months with every day looking at our PMLs and our cash flows, and as Mandi mentioned about our working capitals, um, and looking at the next month and seeing that how are we going to keep our businesses afloat. So this change in thought process um, is going to be permanent. And I think the, the next decade really is going to bring about new winners. The new winners are not just going to be the companies or the hotels uh, which uh, are able to do uh, what they were doing earlier more efficiently. The new winners are going to be the hotel companies who can really come up with some innovative ideation and a new thought process of how to manage more with less as well as ensure that they don't lose the customer share. But it's going to be a very fine balance because, as you also realize, that you know uh, our customers uh, they matter. Ultimately, everybody is going for the same piece of business. When we come from the next table, and when we go to everybody is choosing the same venue, the same station, the same drive to location. So it cannot become a race to the bottom. Race because it's also going to hurt us even more. We are anyway not making even 30% of the money that we are putting to forward. And if we start selling ourselves at those levels, we are going to only compound the problem. So that again is, uh, I would say, a tightrope that we will all have to walk more, I would say, at least one of 2021, where it, we realize at what price do we that really uh, ensure, you know, keeping our businesses going. So these changes in thought process, trying to see more revenue, repurposing your association talent, ensuring that all these metrics uh, that we used to you know, judge ourselves with and our colleagues and partners, uh, uh, you know, would tell us, okay, what's your room to manpower ratio? Uh, what is your efficiency productivity ratio? I think all of that has changed now. It's about uh, what it is that you can afford and what it is that you should be paying to a certain level of business. I mean, our general managers, the people in operations have actually learned uh, that, you know, uh, if there are only three floors of a hotel occupied, how to ensure that those guests can stay on those three four floors get a certain level of service without their whole experience getting diminished. And yet, you know, how to turn off the lights and electricity on the other parts of the hotel. So these learnings uh, are all going to be permanent and uh, people who have been disaptized by this corona fire will definitely come out shinier, hopefully and stronger. And I think the fittest are the ones who will survive through this. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what would be the percentage of hotels who will be there. But I think, uh, um, I, I believe that this industry has resilience. We have been through quite a lot. Uh, nothing as big as corona, but we have been through quite a lot. And surprisingly, the, the industry has always bounced back. It may take um, a quarter or two more than what they're predicting today. And the inherent resilience in the business, our ability to be self-funded and our ability to be self-sufficient is something that we wear as a badge of honor sometimes. Uh, I, mean, I guess it's the biggest state of mind because that's the only way to keep going uh, is going to bring us out really. And uh, I think if we are able to to stop the cash losses in 2021 and then uh, reach at least the 65 to 70% levels of what we were in 2019. That would be a very good starting point for bad businesses. So uh, this is what I feel is for the next 18 to 24 months. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Anuragji. Thanks. It's a really um, a lucid explanation about uh, the rationalization of manpower in the hotel industry and uh, in fact uh, unless you know we do rationalization it's very difficult uh, forget about layoffs you know forget about the people who are leaving the hotel, the hotel industry now think think about the students who are passing out now from all the, um, the hospitality management institutes the catering technologies what will happen to these all these students more than 45 the thousand students are uh, coming out from uh, both the government as well as private institutes and whether hotel industry is going to absorb them or not it's a big challenge now um, if it, because this is uh, this is pandemic this is a global crisis so uh, we are much more worried about uh, giving employment to them and uh, they some of them would like to become entrepreneurs how will how will it happen 
uh, i know as chief uh, operating officer the kind of difficulties which all the hotels are facing but uh, we need not be so much disheartened anurag ji i think uh, some of the banquets are, halls are getting filled up with some marriages because uh, still some bookings are coming up for marriages and some uh, conferences here and there um uh, though it's restricted because the crowd is i think it is 50 to 100 now it i think it may go up the number may go up uh, by government may relax that let's wait and see uh, but uh, people that marriages and all this my tourism may try to you know see some life in the near uh, immediate future but now i uh, request um, uh, the join of uh, uh, kerala tourism um jose dominic ji uh, with whom i have a great association and uh, uh, he has uh, um, been contributing so much and uh, on this domestic you know honorable minister for tourism is also mentioning about focusing on domestic market last year our annual report of ministry of tourism mentions about 28 billion dollar industries what the forex is what uh, in uh, indian uh, 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 indian uh, government gets so the, the 28 billion dollars and also 10 to 11% of employment generation is what domestic uh, tourism offers and internationally if you see um, wttc world uh, tourism and travel council uh, they also mention about 10.5% uh, of gdp the global gdp is what uh, tourism's contribution and uh, more than 10% is what the total employment uh, uh, in the world <clears throat> so this uh domestic uh, tourism as well as international tourism what kind of uh, uh, strategies that we can have marketing the new kind new marketing strategies other day um, some people started going to um, uh, sanctuaries you know national uh, uh, sanctuaries uh, national parks because they want to go to a place where not much population is there right? because of the corona thing so they would like to be safe so which are the safer places definitely may not be in singapore or uh, florida or uh, you know turkey and paris they want to go to kana national park or bandipur or masai mara so this kind of parks is what they are looking at so what should be our re- this, uh, this new strategies in this direction i request uh, just dominic to uh, speak to us on thank you kamal am i audible of course yes okay thank you now before i answer that question specifically let me just get back to the background we are now i think we are in era change we got three eras we have just passing through one i would call it bc then dc and then pc bc is before covid during covid and post covid we are now in the most difficult part which is during covid now here the topic we have used the word revival which is a very optimistic term earlier we were always using the word survival and and it's it's nice to see that we are going past one phase to another from lockdown to unlock and uh, i speak in respect of the experience in my geography in my sector which is the sector of i would call it experiential tourism uh, let us get back to, to to understand kerala's uh, in, in say i entered this field maybe in the 70s at that time we were kerala was considered using the hindi hindi term a bimaru state as far as tourism was concerned from there i think uh, kamal rao has been there as secretary and many others have been there we've gone gone grown from bimaru to a front performing state how in the beginning indian tourism was delhi agra jaipur then claimed the conclave called goa and kerala was i would think modern india everyday india and ordinary india that ordinary it can be extraordinary and everyday can be also magic is what the big the story which i think kerala will will say it is in this context let me just step back one more bit 18 2018 we had the big flood and then we had something which we call very similar called nipa and then we had another flood and i just put one figure 2019 october november december up to january 2020 kerala reported the best figures in our history of arrivals and occupancies ever in our history i think i think uh, uh, mandeep used the term bounce back i use the term 
spring back that we sprung back extraordinarily and uh, therefore in the context of that i'm using that in the current context when we've got something much 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 more devastating than that uh, which is which is this covid but the ability of enterprise to spring back tourism also now, now in kerala the story of tourism is that kerala had left and left of left uh, left and left of left governments tourism is invariably called was capitalist luxury and bourgeois sometimes an embarrassment it is from that background we 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 grew tourism is now accepted in fact since we are uh, kamal, kamal is here i would say there was a time in which bureaucrats out of favor would get a would seek a post in tourism and and coalition minister coalition partners minor coalition partners were given the portfolio of tourism all that has changed now it's only the the bureaucrat in favor the coalition partner is the most powerful which demand that portfolio and that's what kerala that's what has happened there there's not a time in which the, in 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 the newspapers tourism is not mentioned so what has tourism done to kerala one it is perhaps the most successful industry of kerala of that state i'm using the word i'm coming back to kerala i suppose not a national convention but to see the relevance it can have tourism is not uh, what i would think it's it's from that time uh, from from irrelevance tourism today one out of two new one out of three new jobs come from this sector now we have found that statistics shows that 15 lakh employees and 15000 entrepreneurs are in this sector and when the covid hit tourism was first hit worst hit and longest hit and we have not just been hit we have not had a decline we have just we have fallen off the cliff and this is the crisis that we are now a, like a, a crisis of life and a crisis of livelihood and in the crisis of life and i think that is the survival phase we our our representations and demands were always was that was continue to your business allow people have to be protected and the entity the enterprise has to survive so much so that like you guys said when the oxygen uh, mask drops give yourself the oxygen to survive so therefore in in, in the tourism sector we we have a, a crisis of 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 people which many times in fact we went to our chief minister and say give us give up our request was wage support citing the example of the exchequer the chancellor of the exchequer in uk of course our cm said appreciate your request your your representation but this beyond means of the state government you go to delhi of course we've tried we went to faith and do all that reasonable uh, success is there we have got msme recovery msme loans on all of that but but today in as we stand we are moving from survival and hopefully to revival and in the revival phase i think that brings bring brings hope for us a revival would mean i would think what what the covid has done what the cost contagion has done is we have we have disrupted the old status quo completely it's a good advantage and a great it, and as well as as well as a disadvantage it's a great advantage it was mentioned by rao mentioned about 45000 students coming out of of schools and colleges or colleges from hospitality institutions will they have a job in fact i was in a similar position in a, in another in another institute where they asked us to to be there at the, their convocation the same question asked is there any hope for us so the answer we had was that you are in the worst of times and you are in the best of times the best worst of course understandable best because things have all changed there's a new normal there is opportunities which will arise from the new normal so 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 to to state it briefly let us not waste this calamity to change what we could not change for the last 70 years the much we wanted to change but we could not change and perhaps this is the time when we will have the the motivation the energy and the ability to change that 
I think that is very, very important. Now, going forward, going forward for, for revival of the industry, what would we need? I would think uh, you would talked about marketing, international, domestic. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, while we segregate people, segregate uh, markets, uh, the, 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 as domestic, it was Kerala, say, in, in 1970, in the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the mid 80s, Kerala received 25,000 foreign tourists, which was, and then in the, in the early 90s, before, before we, could, we could spring forth, we had 1.3% of international arrivals to India. That has moved to, the, to double digits or 20. In, so next to Rajasthan, they would say, they would be all near Rajasthan, or, or would be the, a big a spring back, a big growth has, ta has taken place. Why was that? It was not because we've got the the world, the best beaches in the world, or the best forests in the world, because the best palaces. There was some reason that brought people here, and that reason we can put it in various terms. And I think that the everyday is magic, and the ordinary is extraordinary. Come back to that, in in the sense that and there we insert the term responsible tourism, or eco tourism, which is now called responsible tourism. That our ability to to create to to protect environment, uh, include community and the local ethos, and that is the big power. And India's biggest strength, I believe, is our huge cultural diversity. There's no country which is so well endowed as India. In the U.S., they would talk about the melting pot. We we where everybody comes together and you have one 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 common factor. But India is not a melting pot. It is a thali, where every dish is kept separately, and all of that you can taste it separately. So these factors, which which are the strength, and I think we must go back to fundamentals. We must now try to approach the destination, the quality is the cleanest, the greenest, and the healthiest. Come what may, that's not compromisable. I think we, I would say that that these are the priorities hereafter. That. I do not think that we have talked about or about about in you know, in the hotel sector about occupancies and uh, I think today today now we'll shift from all that to go into fundamentals. I think now is the time to look at that. Go into the very fundamentals. Now the word holiday itself lift the bar of the lift the bar of the word holiday itself. I think to expect more from a holiday. When you, when you, the moment you say word, the word holiday, and I'm only referring to to leisure travel or holiday travel, but that I think is a discretion travel. All the rest is because of a wedding, because of business, for some other reasons. But this is the this is the potential which has got immense potential of capacity to grow, and grow because of the innate strength of the destination of the nation of the enterprise. And here, uh, see when you look at, and I sorry, I'm coming back to Kerala all the time. When I look at the scenario here, you see that the best and best products of the state are not creations from the big brands or the big corporates. These are creations of small entrepreneurs who did what they could, which is small, in a manner which they knew, which is local. So indigenous and, and small could be, uh, to their credit, became world class. And that was the story of, of that destination. And that will be the story, and that should be the story of India. And this is where and there, so I do. I'm, I'm, I'm saying a unique differentiation of the of of each destination of the nation itself. Now coming back to international, domestic, and and I would I would now divide this even further. There's something called local traveler. I'm in Kochi, city of Kochi, spectacular city, richly endowed by history, backwaters, and uh, perhaps most people in Kochi have seen everything. So the first market is the Cochin market. When when we tried, we, when people took to, took people to uh, to Jew Town, to Fort Cochin, showed them backwaters. They've all seen it before, but now see it with new eyes. I think that's a big market, huge market. Wherever in the, in India you are, wherever you are, there's a new story to tell. And that story is 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 what I think we, the hotel the hospitality or the tourism sector needs to discover. Now coming back to now next to tour in domestic, in domestic. Okay, in 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 local, 
I think there's much, much market in the local. Now in domestic, which has been the big bulk of, of, of travel, there is often a criticism that domestic travel is less is less concerned about about impact, about uh, responsibility of, of and they are and it is said that that go go to a destination because the tourist tourism gets there. That that cannot be a, that can that cannot be any more an acceptable story, and uh, because I believe that the destination interest that the, the purpose of tourism is not the tourist. It is it is what how it can serve tourism it can serve and by community without spoiling the environment. And that is a new that's a paradigm which should not be no no way will that should be it should that should be excused. And uh, there's no, no matter, I think all those theories about ease of doing business, they should not apply. First and foremost, comply with the laws of the land, comply with the environment, and, and what we do should be beneficial to community. Now, coming back to the, the, the people of, of, of the sector, I see 1,500, 15 lakh people. And as I was driving here, uh, I could see big stories in our newspapers about tour operator offices, people selling fish on the road. I myself, not selling fish, but I've gone back to my farm and I've, we've, I'm now engaging in growing tapioca and, 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 I, and, and discovered something so, so fantastic that I believe Kerala's next opportunity, in fact, maybe across India, Opportunity would be the homestead farm. That such a spectacular, spectacular, ready-made, available, widespread asset, which we need to which we need to utilize, where where people can come and live. Everybody in India, everybody in the world, perhaps, will have the roots in farm and agriculture. And getting back into it, it doesn't require huge capital, doesn't require huge technology, and back to basics. How people can go out into the field. It's a it's a spectacular tourism asset and resource, and which we could we could utilize. I I mean I would think that every state. I, mean, I think for for the incredible India, we have incredible farms, incredible practices, incredible diversity, and that is 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 a factor which we must get back to. Now, uh, international travel. I know he said that the last to come back will be international travel. But international travel, we would need, and I see, I think the word that now comes to mind is not competitive advantage, but collaborative advantage. I think it's time now we, we need to collaborate. Collaborate between states, collaborate between neighboring countries. Now we see that how disadvantages we had been about our visa policy, how expensive it was, and even our GST, we had, we had the highest in the world GST at 28%. Now it's probably gone back to 18, gone down to 18 percent, but still perhaps the highest. Just before the COVID, I had occasion to travel as a group of farmers to Israel, and we discovered there that foreign resident, foreign travelers to Israel have a the rate the the VAT there is zero percent. So I believe what India needs and Indian uh, foreign exchange requirement needs as it be, as we go forward is that put priority that put zero percent for foreign travel to India. It's easy to identify. And uh, and I think that's why for two reasons. It is foreign tourism, which has discovered new de new destinations, which lays the benchmark, which give, and reminds us our requirement to be protective environments and to be clean, green, and, and, and uh, conscious of our huge heritage of assets. So, some revival measures besides this action. I, th I, I believe that it, it was referred to that payback in the last two years what GST has been paid. But I think there, in the US they have put something in place. We call it, they call it deductibility. That you redefine your assessment here, that which, which, and you include in the current assessment here, the assessment year previous. That means the previous assessment in India ended 31st March 20, from 19 to 20, 
you include that also and therefore the the losses survived here and incurred here can be set up against profits of the previous year which will give back some cash perhaps to ssc's who are successful now coming coming to moratorium and uh, and uh, restructuring of loans complicated business and i think most enterprises of the scale of small msme kind of tourism enterprise for them it is a, it's a crisis of of solvency and and banks do not serve, fund solvency they they will fund only only uh, profitability so here I, I i believe that there there is a need to put cash into the hands of of or enterprises and enable them to and cash the hands of enterprises by either by by giving back what they have paid in the past in terms of deductibility so in 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 in, in this sense foreign markets for destinations such as india is important because it lays down benchmarks it gives us standards provides standards and uh, and that and therefore new low new areas to be discovered new markets to to, to new destinations adventure and trekking uh, cycling tours all of this have been have uh, have been have been uh, the the part pathfinders have been foreign tourism youngsters who've come trekked walked uh, gone and stayed in villages and um, of course what we need i think what we need is a redrawing of the of the entire charter uh, for example i would just say small thing alcohol policy that uh, and that I'm also talking with reference to again with reference to Kerala. We had in the previous government we we, we had a situation in which 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 the uh, licensing policy was kept only for five star, and we saw devastation that it it done it did. Now, uh, in terms of enabling small restaurants, standalone restaurants to to also be, to survive, in the 60s Australia had a policy similar to ours. And they 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 liberated that. Now the restaurant in industry of in Australia became the highest employer or the first job first job employer. We know that so many people who who have now become uh, leaders of captains of industry had the first job as a part time job in McDonald in a McDonald restaurant. So these kind of jobs work and and earn earn and and study. Are things that must, will come back slowly, and more, as more and more uh, families and uh, become self-dependent, we we have seen the devastation that the COVID will do uh, to enterprises. No longer we can take take incomes for granted, can take uh, inherited wealth wealth for granted, and now you have you have the emergence of two kinds of travelers. One already I think and Anurag uh, referred to. Which is the revenge traveler? I introduce another term, which is called the, which is called the frugal traveler. Travelers who know that they will not have, they are not as capable of earnings as before. They've lost much of their assets. They they got wiped out on the share market, and all that has happened. But still, travel is so important to them. In fact, when you really look at it, why do people work? Why do people work? One of the strong motivations of work. Is ability to to enrich yourself by by experiences of travel. So travel, I'm sure, is going to come back in a very very strong way. And the opportunity that this this COVID has given to us is now redraft, redraft everything that we know, and uh, putting back, going back to fundamentals, fundamental grassroots greenfield levels. I remember I I, I did a course. In, in in the city of Agra, and in a course for two weeks, and and part of our routine was every day walk to the Taj Mahal and come back, and we walk through all those streets, and I wondered that if Taj Mahal is the is is one of the prime reasons which bring pull people to India, the the monument, but the city was one prime reason why people should not come to the city. The way that I experienced that city. Perhaps it's, more, it's it's improved now, but the moment we can we can 
we, we are able to address something so simple as so fundamental as that, then we know that India can move forward. I believe that the COVID will give us that determination that we have to be the cleanest, the greenest, and the healthiest. There's no, there's no, 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 there's no getting away from that. This is the this is the disruptive change, innovation that we need. We have we have been given with, and uh, from from a from a destination point of view, from an enterprise point of view, from from uh, in all this tourism, which is the worst hit, the the most badly hit. I think the I'm sure there we we will we'll see many many changes happening. Many enterprises may fold up. Uh, at the same time. The inherent strength of of India as a destination remains by the fact that we are such a large population, and we are such a diversified, uh, such a diverse uh, cultural diversity. And how do we? And and we also seen that the prime requirement for our for us is finding livelihood and jobs, and which tourism can serve. So. To your question about about uh, both uh, survival from and as we move from uh, uh, revival as we move from from the phase of survival and two what markets how would we and en en engage in new markets the the market of in international market I think fundamentally the, it, it is the baseline uh, the, the baseline would be clean green and healthy. And that's the baseline, and there's no way you can you can get away from that. And uh, so here I introduce I use a term called uh, it's a, I, I'm borrowing from from a, an old researcher in tourism in Europe, uh, Peter Adam uh, Adderhold. He uses the term the alert independent traveler, and in, he had used two terms the AIT alert independent traveler and the sun sand surf traveler, which was who was they. SSS traveler. Who are they? The SSS was one who, for whom he was not prepared for any unexpected. One he wanted the best. For example, if I was in a hotel, the best food, the best carpet, the best bed, and all of that. That is what uncompromised. White when it said sun sand surf, white sands, 27 degrees water, Celsius water. He cares a damn about everything else. The AIT, on the other hand, for him, it was a voyage of discovery. For him, it had to be what was happening in the neighborhood, what is the impact of his own travel to the destination, and all of those became so important. It is the Stateler used to be was considered to be the father of hoteling, the 1920s, and uh, he had a rule of thumb, uh, and he was asked uh, of thumb of hotel pricing, and one question of what created the good hotel, he said one location. Two location and three location. Today that meant room with a view. I think that too has changed now. Now it's no longer room with the view, but the view from, but the room, but the, the but the view of the room from the view. Today many destinations fail because the the view of the room from the view is is gone down. So it's no longer that it is to be centralist to your to your own self requirements. So this these these. That we have to preserve and protect our, our, the view, preserve and protect the environment, care for a community, and then we can say that rest of it, profitability, uh, rest of it, occupancy, all that come afterwards. And uh, if you take that, if you want to make money, you'll never make money. If you want to be excellent, you'll end up making money too. That that that, that saying that, I think we use the the COVID as the the uh, our opportunity to make to change the status quo. Difficult in normal times, but I think in these times that's the biggest advantage. That's that's the best way we can use a calamity. So yeah. I'll I'll like stop for the moment here, and uh, we'll carry on when the time comes. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's a really comprehensive analysis of uh, the challenges that we are facing now. Especially, I'm happy and glad that you know you have mentioned about uh, the greenery. Going back to the farm earlier, you know, for, to be to be healthy, 
we used to go to the farm houses and now from uh, people are going to the farms no more to the farm houses even the farm houses also have become highly vulnerable now to this uh, covid uh, so people are going to the farms and trying to live in the villages uh, so you, you mentioned a good point that you know we have to use this opportunity to create uh, cleanliness you know that hygienic environment uh, uh, once we bounce back after two years according to the uh, Mandeep ji and according to Andra, you know, all that. If you, if you think that you know, two years is a time, this is a big time where you know you can do this uh, cleaning um, and creating safety measures. Uh, that is uh, certainly yes. It is uh, people uh, who all the stakeholders' responsibility to uh, do this. And uh, before I get back on this, uh, your collaborative advantages of uh, every country to have. Now I would like to ask uh, Mandeep Singh ji that you know, we, we, we the most important uh, um, aspect of uh, rejuvenating the demand is uh, trying to reaffirm uh, every customer, every traveler about the health and hygiene. Okay. Now, how is this hotel industry coping up these health uh, uh, protocols? Okay. Now, for, for example, ITDC, we have signed an MOA with AIMS uh, to uh, to advise us. I have seen this. The you know, Four Seasons Hotel has entered into an MOA with the John Hopkins. So, um, copying that, you know, we entered an MOA with AIMS and uh, the doctors came to ITDC Ashoka and uh, Samrat Hotel and they trained our manpower because now, Recruiting uh, just manpower is not sufficient. Recruiting them with some skills on, in the health sector, in hygienic protocols is very important. Though we have microbiologists, all the five-star and four-star hotels are having microbiologists. Um, uh, training this other uh, manpower also very essential now in uh, health uh, protocols. Suddenly something happens to a customer. Uh, so, and how do you call a doctor? How do you do the first first aid? Uh, this This kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, new skills to be imparted to the manpower in the hotel. I we would like to know how the hotel industry uh, in this country, or in, in case internationally they are coming out with the new new new, new um, technologies in improving health protocols. Can can you please uh, let let us know on this? Sure. Um, you know um, we've come a long way actually in hospitality where. It used to be all about a people's business. Um, and now the one thing that we are reducing is, you know, physical presence of people just so as to maintain the social distancing or the physical distancing inside hotels. And we are looking at contact less, so fewer people. So that's a big paradigm shift for the hotel industry uh, in itself. Um, hotels are always very, very high on hygiene uh, and safety standards. It's not something which is new to the industry. It's just that this pandemic has obviously created newer standards um, that we need to now follow for the safety of both the people, our people who work inside these hotels, and of course for our guests who are going to be coming to these hotels. We need to follow a certain protocol of the new normal of uh, you know, sanitization, safety, hygiene. Um, I think, as you mentioned, uh, almost all the hotel companies have tied up, um, you know, with uh, one or the other large, either sort of hygiene company or a hospital uh, to adapt certain protocols. Uh, I find this also, um, you know, a full uh, 360 degree change because when hospitals were being set up, in the country, they were turning to hotels to understand the hospitality business. And now uh, hotels are turning to hospitals to understand the sort of hygiene uh, and uh, sort of cleanliness and safety standards business in as much as health is concerned. So it's been collaborative uh, in both ways. Um, while I think that has been very essential and very critical, uh, but I think the one aspect that I'd like to bring out is that uh, you know, sticking a label outside your hotel or in any communication that you have followed a certain safety protocol is not going to be enough. Uh, purely marketing that label is not going to be enough. You spoke about training the people and I think that's the most critical part of what we need to do. It is going to be all about training because this is a real situation where somebody can get infected and that and this is willy-nilly uh, a life-threatening disease. And therefore, it cannot at any stage be taken 
with any callousness or lightness. So therefore, the training aspect is going to be the most critical part. And I think hotels are spending a lot of effort in training people uh, and getting those protocols right. Of course, we're spending a lot of money on technology, which Anurag alluded to earlier, that technology is reasonably affordable. And therefore, to use as much technology as possible to try and avoid uh, the physical contact uh, when guests come into the hotel is something that most hotels are following and which is helping. Uh, but, you know, to narrate uh, some of my personal experiences uh, in the last and, and in fact, today, uh, you know, we, we do an article every Monday on, on which we post on LinkedIn. It's called Monday Musings. Uh, if you read today's story, it is about this very subject. Um, and, and this came from a personal experience of my last few visits. I've been visiting, um, you know, some of these establishments just to see how we are coping up with it. Uh, and I think that in some of our smaller establishments or let's say restaurants, um, uh, which are smaller, uh, standalone, um, while there are, they are ticking the boxes uh, of protocol safety, hygiene, uh, you know, there's a sanitizer, there's, you know, all of that is happening at the gate and, you know, someone's checking your temperature and all that is happening. It was interesting to see that I was at a restaurant uh, having a meal and um, there was a table sitting, uh, the next table, reasonable sufficient distance, all of that, no issues. Uh, but two or three things didn't happen, uh, which should have happened. Um, one is that, um, when we wanted to order our meal, uh, we were given physical menus, um, you know, whereas there was a provision uh, with a QR code which was put on the table where you could just scan the menu uh, and you needn't have a physical menu, but nobody in the staff was trained enough to tell us that. So we were never told that there is an opportunity that you can just scan your menu. Uh, and you needn't touch a physical menu, which if every guest is touching a physical menu, then obviously there are concerns there, right? The second aspect uh, that when, when we were settling our bill uh, was again that there was no contactless facility of settling your bill. You had to either pay cash or credit card, both of which actually involved touching stuff. And it was only after I pressurized that they made a facility of me have being able to pay the bill uh, online again staff not, question of staff not being trained while they had that facility and the third thing i noticed was that the table which was sitting next to us when they left the table was obviously redone and they had redone everything and laid it back and then um, i was talking to the manager i was trying to tell him all of this and he was trying to tell me how they are being very particular about everything and sanitization and i asked him a question i said this is the table that has just been remade by you. Now you think this is ready for the next guest to come? He said, yes, sir. I said, see, I was watching and I'll tell you the thing that I'm not happy. The person came, he sanitized the table completely thoroughly. They used the sanitizer, they wiped, cleaned all of it. You know, they sprayed the chairs, all of that was done. But what you're not doing, and this is where training uh, comes into play, is that the first thing that a guest does when he comes to the restaurant and he's going to sit is he's going to pull that chair to sit down and it's the back of that chair which needs to be thoroughly sanitized because that's his first touch point the second touch point is he's going to pull that chair in when he sits down so the arms of the chair or the sides of the chair have to be thoroughly sanitized Right. So while they did the whole drill, they were not particular about these things. So this is where I think the industry needs to step in a little, um, you know, especially like I said, and I said this earlier that the larger uh, players must help the smaller ones because sometimes the smaller ones do not have the ability to do everything that is required to be done. So somebody must adopt some of these smaller players in a city or in a locality or in a geography Make a small team of people who are available who can go around. See, the industry must learn to support the industry. It cannot be, uh, you know, I for myself. In these kind of pandemics and these kind of situations, the industry must support the larger purpose, the larger cause. And where, you know, the larger players have the ability and have the learning, uh, you know, to pass on to others, this must be done. 
this is i think something which is of concern because we are opening up the industry and we have uh, you know made a lot of noise of how we must open up and 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 it's great that the industry is opening up but i think we owe the responsibility of making sure that we do everything that we need to do so while uh, i have to say that the industry has really risen uh, to the occasion there's a lot of stuff that is happening inside hotels and restaurants like it's never happened before but i think training is something that come is critical and i do feel that our smaller standalone hotels and restaurants will need to be supported by the larger players in this yeah <clears throat> thank you so much mandeep this industry supporting industry is a very good point that uh, big hoteliers will have to support uh, the small hoteliers in terms of giving uh, training to them and uh, using uh, institutions also training institutions and uh, uh, come forward and uh, you know take up their manpower and put them on the training uh, which this training doesn't take much time because uh, oh. already they have been trained earlier when they were doing their training courses in uh, catering technology and hospitality management institutes but this is the new protocol and the training new protocol doesn't take more than a week for example itdc lashoka and samrat we have given training with, uh, within 15 days of time we finished that uh, training um, uh, module uh, but uh, i i want anurag uh, to mention more about this te technology that e e menu or uh, you know contactless um, payments so what kind of technologies that we are using in other hotels uh, in the country we would like to know itdc we already we have e menu we have uh, e payments uh, of course bigger hotels i'm sure they must have but what is your advice to the um, three star hotels the two stars or uh, you know, smaller uh, budget hotels <clears throat> so i think i think the technology today is uh, uh, very agnostic and it can be adopted by i would say not necessarily only restricted to luxury hotel uh, and i think it's uh, a way to use and uh, so i think covid has only accelerated the process of technology adoption and and uh, we were always uh, you know debating and you know looking at how to be in a high touch business as hospitality digital was how to go high touch and high tech together now covid has made it low touch high tech that's what has happened after the advent of covid so technology today whether it's a contactless check in the usage of qr codes it literally starts the time you receive a gift here for uh, the sanitization technology using ultraviolet and then the qr codes in the car which really gives you your digital signature uh, which becomes like you know it gives you every information that you need about the here the hotel that you are checking in and about anything that you may want to access and use with the server then when you check in there is a contact like this process you can and there is mobile technology which you can use your mobile device as a key to the room uh, using you know uh, uh, near field communication or through technology inside the room many services in terms of the room redesign have now changed I and mean, they're using the usage of the writing table which is no longer relevant or the mini bars or even the telephone which exists in the room today is really used only for calling the services so there is technology today which literally like using artificial intelligence which allows you to use your device for many functions and many services including like a uh, a bot chat and getting into a e butler kind of forum where whatever you need is there like a whatsapp chat that you reach out and it can be delivered to your room and even the devices in the room can today assist you with the right kind of lighting the temperature the control of uh, you know whether you want to put the room on bd and even tell you the amount of water that is being consumed as well and so forth so there is a lot of technology uh, and as i said right now the priority was to bring the whole contact like service and to ensure that there was a feeling of safety and sanitization that would be preferred to um, every one is tied up Uh, with some international partner or some credible partner to ensure that you know uh, our guests always feel and, and that's also led by technology to ensure that our guests always feel not just the guests but also associates they feel that they are safe and they want to talk about the guests the other area where technology is being used is for centralization like you know the 
ایگری ہوتا ہے وہ ہے فائیو ٹو سکس ہنڈریڈ ڈپینڈنگ آن دا سائز آف دی ڈیٹا ناؤ اب اٹ نیڈ ٹو کلاؤڈ ٹیکنالوجی بیسڈ ٹیکنالوجی کورنگ دیٹ وی ڈونٹ ہیو ٹو وی ڈونٹ انویسٹ ان دی ہارڈ ویئر देयर आर एप्स दैट कैन रियली मेक अ पर्सनल पुश द कंपेंसेशन बेनिफिट्स ट्रैकिंग ऑफ लीव देयर इज देयर इज देयर आर एप्स दैट कैन मेक योर एफएस रिपोर्टिंग सो मच मोर एजाइल एंड नेबल सो वी आर इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ एम्ब्रेसिंग एंड अडॉप्टिंग दिस टेक्नोलॉजी अक्रॉस द कैबिनेट ऑफ दी होटल नॉट जस्ट इन टर्म्स ऑफ ओनली द यू नो गेस्ट फेसिंग टेक्नोलॉजी बट आल्सो हार्ड एंड हाउस इंक्लूडिंग फायर लाइट एंड सेफ्टी एंड अदर एस्पेक्ट्स which will bring immense value to our guests as well as make us more efficient yeah <clears throat> thanks a lot for those inputs and uh, josh i would like to request you to speak a uh, little bit uh, now on the near about uh, this um, the wellness tourism which we are talking about because as a part of our survival and the revival of our industry uh, in this country you know um, uh, whether it is domestic or international now people are looking forward towards health and safety so when you are talking about health you know if you see the numbers you know compared to the globally global uh, numbers of uh, um, uh, uh, infected uh, number as well as uh, even death rate if you see the lowest um, uh, death rate is in india now so it's not, not even touched one lakh okay so people may be observing this people are noticing this globally they are saying you know what is that uh, what is the essence of uh, the, the lifestyle of uh, 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 indian uh, standards so people are examining this lifestyle pattern of the indians you know what are the um, what do they consume how do they live how do they what do they consume in with the spices is it because of uh, jawar if it is because of uh, um, uh, the ganges ganges water water ganges we don't know uh, whether himalayas or uh, people are examining this so if, when you talk about the wellness tourism whether you see a revival thing in this wellness sector uh visa with the international tourist number in context of corona let me come back come to the question i just touch up on the previous question about technology on on a, on a different view yeah, of please it. go ahead. uh see what this is i said in 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 many of our resorts we use thatch in fact in one place thatch we have 150000 square feet of thatch what is what does that do every every 15 months we have to replace the thatch big job expensive business uh, brings a lot of disruption but what does thatch enable us to do it 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 with obvious a need for air conditioning so now i am looking at in 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 these times that that when you look at some of our all traditional practices they somehow maybe provide remedies here now you say qr code or i would say another thing is menu of the day why is it that we must be subject to we must subject to guests to the tyranny of choice we know what we can do we have a great story to tell we we we, we tell the story to the food with all the preparation that we need and make that menu of the day therefore he does not need to have a menu to say select the moment he sits down he knows what he's going to eat of course all the rest of it this the sanitary conditions wipe down all that must follow i'm just looking at ways in which we have to approach it now coming to your your question about wellness we we as a hotel group entered wellness in a very and and, and let me tell you an anecdotal story we uh we changed our name it used to be casino group hotels in the year 2004 for some reasons we we dropped that name and and put and our brand we put our name as cgh earth earth was because we thought that is the that gave us the aspirational model of nature and then the brand advisor said you can't use you can't use earth you need to a proprietary prefix to it so we and he and his advice we put cgh which would may, which would mean uh, casino group hotel people read it as so they will know that the old casino people have not sold and gone away and uh, so our name is that the the word earth for the core values that we hold of environment community and local cgh if you ask me what it stands for clean green healthy that's what the, the our, our aspiration is 
Now, when we started this, some newspaper carried an article that we have changed our name and that we are going to expand in, in, in Kerala. So the Tambarati of the palace of Kollangur gave me Tambarati princess in, in, the, in the Malayalam world, gave me a call and said, uh, would, could you people consider making our palace into a hotel? I said, palace and hotel, Rajasthan has proved how successful they can be. Let's have a look at your palace. Then she said, not a condition, but a big concern. Never has meat been eaten in our palace. Never has wine been drunk, wine been drunk in our palace. And when Lord Willingdon came to our palace in 1928, my great grandfather informed the, the Viceroy that never has anyone entered wearing leather shoes. So her question was, can you make this palace without shoes, wine, and meat? The hotel. So that was a challenge, and therefore we decided to move to Ayurveda. Ayurveda. So why we we went to Ayurveda is that we follow the follow the the traditions in the most. We were not new to it, so we were the best advice, the best advisors, the best know how, and we went entered into it. And uh, what did, what uh, what what Ayurveda really looks at is. In fact, to cut the story to short, a, a friend of mine, very dear friend of mine in Germany, and we had a very many programs running. A, 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 Germany asked me, I've got, he said, my friend has got uh, third degree or fourth times. He has been, he has, he's, he, he's got, he's got, a, he's got cancer and, and uh, he's losing hope. He asked me, we, can your Ayurveda, he's a foreigner, can your Ayurveda provide, provide a cure for it? I said, wait, I can't answer that question. Let me ask my physician. And he said, tell him that Ayurveda has no cure for cancer. But Ayurveda will just strengthen your body. That's all that Ayurveda will do. And hope the body will take care of itself. That's exactly what Ayurveda and, and traditional medicine can do. It strengthen your body. Building your immunity system, and that in today's times is 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 now not not necessarily a need to go to an Ayurveda hospital. To learn. Some of the practices there, your lifestyle practices about food you eat, about uh, walking barefoot, uh, and and yoga and Ayurveda and meditation and all that is perhaps of course when you go to the allopath they will say it's all mumbo jumbo. But there's a whole tradition behind it. And we are now finding that I think in Kerala, you, you will know that they are now distributing homeopathic medicine in villages. And the results show that, that the, 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 the numbers which become positive in those villages are statistically less than in the other villages. I'm not getting to those, those kind of issues now. But that's how we, we entered into wellness. In the most strictest, in the, without compromise, to the minimum, you will stay ten days. You 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 will you will be subjected to to the diet, uh, swatic diet, vegetarian, and then of course uh, there was a ghee treatment and all those treatments. Today it 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 languished in the first few years. With our occupancies were about five and six percent. Still. It so happened, and I think the story is that till there was a New York Times carried a big article about this place. And thereafter, it's been today uh, uh, probably it's a price leader, and people can uh, you difficult to get room. Uh, now, of course, we've, we've shut them down, but they've got NABH accreditation, and they they are providing a, a medical system which is proven. And which is available, and which is entirely local, which which know how become completely local, and the 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 as a, as a product, as wellness as a product, well-being as we would say as a product, it offers immense potential for local, domestic, and the world. Uh, and in in this sense. Uh, the, what has the COVID has done to that? We have both Ayurveda as well as naturopathy. What has COVID done to that is, and I think the moment, the number of 
telephonic queries coming across from around the world is that we are just waiting for our ability to travel and come back and come to what the mm. promise that Indian wellness, Indian Ayurveda, Indian Pragati uh, Chilsa, as we call it, offers. So I'm sure this will be discovered. And coming back to in hotels, but earlier, you, the classification system required you to have a health club. So in our hotels, we said we don't have health club. We've got yoga and Ayurveda. Initially, the, the regulator said, sorry, unless you have those machines where you can you can uh, trample on and all that, uh, or you, must, you cannot have it. But now those, those have changed. Now you, you can have that, you can have, so incorporating our traditional knowledge into a modern way, into modern products is what India can do. And in, 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 in creating products, it's not necessary that we have to follow paths which have been shown by, by, by the global brands. But I, I believe that there are, that we can have our indigenous path, which will be, uh, which will, which will be global beaters. But, so wellness yeah. and and uh, which is which is the product which is uh, which, which hotels can offer as part of a facility or it can be a dedicated purpose-built wellness places is, is an opportunity which we have discovered yeah. and among among talking about 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 uh, let's say uh, sustainability profitability we found our wellness places are far higher profitability than the other places there's no seasonality to it it is there's no high season low season we have fewer guests because every guest will stay for two weeks uh, so these are opportunities they are res uh, ideal resources which reside in the, in the country and i think uh, maybe these will, these will be the the ways forward post the pc era to the post-COVID era. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jos. I think we may have to wind up now, and we'll go for some questions. Anybody, you know, so, we'll take Ayurveda, Nani, Siddha, and uh, uh, homeopathy. The Ministry of Aish is really um, marketing our traditional knowledge systems in a big way, and from uh, cities, it has gone to the villages now. What are the products, and uh, from the first hit and the worst hit. To the longest hit, I'm sure this will be one of the first to survive and first to revive also. Let us hope so. So let us take the questions now. Um, so there is actually just one question. Yeah. Uh, that could be for you only CMD ITDC because this was okay. with reference to your uh, observation regarding uh, 45,000 students coming out of IHMs. So right. Mr. Mr. Sunil Kumar has pointed out that very rightly alarmed by Mr. Rao about the student passing out from catering institutes. What better future they can have in COVID scenario? Some tips which may still motivate them. So this is a question for you, sir. Anybody would like to take on this? Otherwise, I have my own uh, take on uh, how to provide employment to these people. Um, uh, you want to take up uh, Mandeep or uh, Madhura? Well, uh, no? I can say one thing that uh, opportunity for us uh, so we have four hotels at various stages of reopening, and these are in key markets and large industries. So there would be, uh, uh, I can say, there would be one for uh, uh, talent. Four of our hotels are opening in 2020. So yes, there are opportunities across all the levels that we shall have in the company. Um, yeah, Josh. Yeah, what I would say is, I think now, post-COVID, uh, I wish that time of post-COVID will come sooner than later, that post-COVID, we will see a great fear is there among students who, are, who have ventured into the hospitality studies, hoping for a future and career and that. So COVID has now changed many things. So current... Consequent to that and corresponding to that, I think students also need to, to re relearn and re-equip themselves. So in terms of, of uh, don't call yourself uh, F&B, those, those hospitality terms, uh, 
food production. I think it needs to be now you need a much more uh, wider knowledge. Mm. Fundamentally, people come to a hotel, uh, they will, or as a people, people come to a destination, that's where you begin with. So knowledge about your own history and your geography is, is, is as important as how to cook food and make a bed. And, and when you combine these two, that brings, that brings you a, a great new ability. And uh, standards of, of, of uh, you see, the, the food is first thought about, then seen, then smelled, and then eaten. So, yeah. so to keep, keep yourself in the, in the earlier processes on how to describe food. So I even wonder why there should be a menu in a, in fact, I, I learned this from a, the Japanese in, in a Japanese hotel. They never give you a menu. They will, you sit down and say, this is the, this is the food of the day. And what excitement is there when that, when I don't have to go the drudgery of looking at a menu, 25 different items and choose one item from that. What, do, what difference does it make? But on the other hand, the hotel has made something which they are proud of and they're confident of. And when you sit down there, they serve it to you. That reminds me of a story of in Hiroshima. In Hiroshima, I mean, that's unconnected, but after the, after the bomb next morning, there's an old inn there. And the innkeeper came and then, as before, as before, in the last 30 years before he had been doing, and he was laying out the, laying out the, the table, as he had done 30 years before that, as before, the correct way, uh, putting the mission ply in place, the fork and spoon, everything then. Little did he realize that there are no more customers. In a way, I'm drawing that from that. In a way, the code has done similar. The customer itself has also changed. What we have, what we saw in the, in the past is no longer there in the present. He is now a new customer, the new normal. So this is when the knowledge that the IHM graduate must come in, the student must come in, is now, he's now got a wiped clean plate. Now, use ingenuity, use your knowledge to create something, uh, whether it's for the hotel, whether it's for the restaurant, whether it's for the staff, a great opportunity to now, to now, there will be much more recipient years, recipient minds to new changes. and this. Is I think one of the uh, opportunities of the contagion that we can we have to wipe the place wipe the slate clean. We got a we got a new era, a post-COVID era, and in which era we can we can dump some of the things that we wanted to dump earlier. We could not do. We can do it now. And now and and knowledge and and, and ability and motive and and seeing a future through new eyes so i'm not i'm not i'm not i'm not being very specific but i'm saying this is a big opportunity that is there mandeep uh, you would like to uh, reply to this i'm just i, I uh, reply i'm going to be very quick because unfortunately Mr. Rao, i need to move on I have okay. another... uh, uh, but i think just two quick points uh one of course is that this industry isn't going anywhere. So uh, I'd, I'd like all the students who are in catering college to uh, be rest assured that, uh, you know, uh, they made a good career choice and there's nothing that they need to be really fearful of. Um, we've had a blip, um, you know, so obviously for, for, for in the current scenario, it's going to be a little difficult. Uh, but I don't see this lasting for more than a year before recruitment processes start, uh, um, you know, all over again once we are back. Um, you know, uh, picking up business by the middle of next year. The other thing is that, uh, you know, typically if you look at the employment pattern of uh, hotel management graduates from catering colleges across the country, uh, not everybody comes and works for the hospitality industry, by the way. Uh, a lot of people go and work for a number of allied industries, uh, which has been our vein. Uh, we've been sort of trying to see how we can bring these people into uh, the hospitality fold. Uh, but uh, you know, because of the nature of the training they get and the grooming, uh, you know, they are perfect um, for many other industries where they want well-groomed people who can speak well and communicate well. 
so therefore uh, this is not the end of this is not the end of their uh, sort of employment uh, journey they'll be picked up by lots of other allied industries and i think it's only a temporary blip hang in there guys don't lose hope this is still a fabulous industry the way this industry is going to see growth because in a in a country of our size and, and with our size of economy um, our hotel sector is still pretty small uh, we have a, a a huge growth potential which is going to come our way uh, in the subsequent years uh, and therefore this is a great opportunity for those who are choosing to make a career in this industry so don't get disheartened by the fact that right now things are looking bleak this is a temporary blip yeah so since um, they are asking me also to address this issue which is a big challenge uh, i i have a different take on this you know uh, i would like to say that your self reliance is very very important so you be an entrepreneur job uh, more than job seekers uh, you give job your job become a job giver okay so my idea is that you know these people should form into the society small small societies like five member society 10 members of society so you know come together and take up uh, restaurant uh, businesses you know um, in fact i am trying up trying trying in delhi in a small uh, small way to give uh, training in uh, entrepreneurship and uh, give to them give to some government buildings of 1000 sft or 2000 sft so and in the private sector for example in delhi you have in gurgaon in noida so many apartments and complexes Are there so many um, villas, uh, no gated communities are there. So who are the people who are running restaurants in these gated villas? Only some contractors who have no knowledge about uh, health protocols. In case you 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 line up, uh, you interact with these uh, societies and the gated communities, they can give you thousand SFT or two thousand SFT, perhaps more than that, depending on your investment levels. And under Atmanibar Bharat, you can always get bank loans and start start societies. of catering to, uh, catering units okay so let's say for 100 100 apartments uh, uh, 100 apartments uh, uh, gated community will there are many people who go to their offices morning sending their children they are very busy not uh, not uh, not having much time to prepare their breakfast and come back uh, they don't have time to prepare dinners so in the same apartments if you have some good restaurant uh, giving you uh, giving them good hygienic food with hygienic protocol i am sure there are many people to take up so my um, uh, request and appeal to all these uh, students who are passing out to become self reliant be entrepreneur form form into societies and collaborate with each other and as uh, jos was mentioning as anurag was mentioning a huge opportunity there you know, a huge opportunity in the market uh, go to go to the market and uh, you know society will absorb you rather than earlier only hotel was absorbing you now entire society is there to absorb that is my suggestion so with this uh, if no other question is there we wind up you know thank you so much mandeep and uh, josh uh, anurag for joining this webinar and i hope we will revive and i'm sure we will revive thank you so Perhaps. much absolutely thank you very much for the pleasure to be listening to our you know speakers like josh and anurag uh, great views great learning and of course to have actually uh, met with you mr rao i haven't met you in the past so great opportunity thank you very much Thank you so much. Namaskar. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you, Thank you Mandeep. I, I don't know if we also met before. Of course, we yeah. have. Kamal, of course, we 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 met several times, and uh, <laughs> look forward to better times. But not they will not come. We have to create them. Absolutely. Stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.